CICPA Town Hall, a high-impact news broadcast to help you navigate the most pressing issues facing the profession. Get timely and critical information, real-time interpretation and analysis. Learn strategies, best practices, and capabilities to drive long-term success for your clients and organization. Thursdays at 3 p.m. Eastern Time. Good afternoon and welcome to the AICPA Town Hall Series. I'm Eric Auskerson, one of your hosts for today. As you can see, we're coming to you from the AICPA New York studio. And later in the show, Carl Peterson will be joining me at the desk. It's great to be here, Eric, in New York. <laughs> Thanks, Carl. We've got a great show. Um, here's today's agenda. We're going to kick things off with a, a profession update. Uh, talk about what's happening in Washington, D.C., and then we're going to have a great discussion with the national taxpayer advocate, Aaron Collins. We're going to give you updates on the K-2 and K-3 schedules with some other technical updates. Uh, we're going to have Carl's Corner, where he gives you some tax season strategies, and then we're going to have our open forum. Uh, so once again, welcome to the AIC Bay Town Hall Series. We've got over 9,000 attendees attending uh, every other week and we also have a lot of press in attendance here's the lineup of presenters I, I look forward to introducing them as they join the show so to start off uh first we want to mention that our thoughts and prayers are with the, the people of ukraine uh, we clearly support uh the actions and steps that the u.s government and other nations are taking President Biden's State of the Union address clearly uh, addressed this, and he received a lot of bipartisan support. Uh, so we are we are thinking about Ukraine, and just you know what what does this all mean related to some of the things that we've been discussing over the past couple of months? Uh, it absolutely means that this geopolitical landscape is going to change. You know what's happening from a legislative standpoint in D.C. It's adding a lot of economic uncertainty, and it's also putting increased pressures on the supply chain. So we, uh, at the start of this year, we talked about has inflation peaked? We're seeing now, you know, oil prices at you know at 115, 120 dollars a barrel. So clearly, things have changed there. The stock market's going up and down with wild swings uh, during the week. Lots of uncertainty. Uh, there are increasing pr pressures related to the supply chain. We're probably going to have Marcy Russell, the economist, joining us uh, in an upcoming town hall to discuss this further. Related to the legislative activities, the, the Build uh, Back Better bill, Biden did not even mention that in the State of the Union address. Uh, Senator Manchin just you know, commented about it yesterday. It does not seem uh, very likely at all that anything's going to happen with that legislative bill and even uh, you know some additional business relief right now that is just not uh looking possible um with 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 congress finally here the final bullet here highlights that and, and many of you probably heard this during uh, the state of the union there's been a chief pandemic fraud officer appointed i remember back in april of 2020 we talked about how there would be you know, reviews and investigations done with all the business relief. So this is not a surprise. Uh, the, uh, the administration has now appointed a fraud officer who's going to look at the, you know, the idle loans, unemployment, PPP, uh, do, do a wide review of all the business relief uh, and other programs that occurred over the past couple of years. So more to come on that. What I'd like to do now is to have Aaron Collins uh, the National Taxpayer Advocate join us, as well as Melanie Lorenzen, who is a senior manager in the tax area, and she's going to lead this discussion uh, with Aaron. So welcome, Aaron and Melanie. Great to have you. Thanks, Thank Eric. You. Thank you, Eric. And I really do have the privilege of introducing someone that really doesn't need an introduction, so I'm going to keep it short. Erin Collins brings with her 15 years of experience in the IRS's Office of Chief Counsel and 20 years at KPMG. She is the voice of the taxpayer. And when she uses that voice, 
people listen. And with that, once again, I am honored to have Aaron Collins speaking with us today. So Aaron. Thanks, Melanie. I'm glad to be here. Um, thank you all for uh, inviting me here. I think it's really important part of the job that I have is, you know, to get the word out, um, you know, what we're seeing within the IRS, but just as important to establish relationships with the folks on the outside, because what you're experiencing with respect to your uh, taxpayers and clients, we need to know where the problems are, the challenges are. Uh, Melanie, as you alluded to, I was at KPMG for 20 years. And so I kind of was similar to you sitting in that chair, dealing with clients on a day-to-day -day basis and all the oops and the challenges and the problems. So within KPMG, we sort of had a network that we all reached out to each other and talked about problems. Well, now when I'm in the IRS, I don't have that similar network on the outside. So I really depend on organizations like the AICPA and others to really let us know what you're seeing so we can help. Um, you know, we're all in this together. We're just trying to make tax administration better for taxpayers, for practitioners, for the IRS, um, and how we can do things better. You're right. We are in this together. And in January, you submitted a report to Congress in which you make various administrative and legislative recommendations. As you know, we align on various recommendations there. Are you comfortable with your administrative recommendations in that the IRS is actually able to implement them without statutory help? Yeah, so the, the code section 7803 is which sets forth the requirements for the NTA, the, both the annual uh, report and our June report, um, specifically uh, gives us, I guess, authority or, or instructs us to make administrative and legislative recommendations. And we do, when we make those recommendations, really step back and look at the business side of it. It's not just a wish list of things that would have, could have, should have happened, but rather what are things that the IRS could in fact implement to improve either taxpayer service or protect taxpayer rights. So when we do make those recommendations, we do take into account what we think is actually practical and doable on behalf of taxpayers. So that's great. Um, and obviously you've seen that the IRS has stopped some automated collection activities. Um, you know that we don't feel that the IRS has done enough. And it kind of feels that the IRS has kind of been stretching this out and offering piecemeal approach. But yesterday you posted a blog covering this topic. Can you touch base on the blog real quickly? Yeah, sure. So I think some of the confusion um, that is coming is when the IRS released its notice. Um, it specifically listed uh, the actual notices that it's suspending. But what it didn't do was take the next logical step which is if we're not issuing the first notice, then we're not gonna issue the subsequent notices. And it didn't list those. So um, some of the questions that have come up um, are with respect to, uh, I have to always cheat and look at my notes, CP91 and CP92, um, which a lot of people were concerned. But you know, when you follow the logic of the IRS by shutting down the previous notices and shutting down in essence the program, those subsequent notices will not be issued. So I, I don't think the IRS was crystal clear when they issued the notice um, indicating what is being uh, suspended pending, uh, you know, working the backlog. Um, they It took a little longer than I would have liked, but um, they did finally listen. Um, I think a lot of the challenges that we were hearing from practitioners as well as taxpayers was really twofold with respect to telephones and correspondence. One is what's the status of my refund? What's the status of processing of my return? And the second was, I received a notice that said X. I have sent subsequent uh, correspondence, but I keep getting those automated notices. Please stop the automated notices. So the IRS has listened, um, and it looks like the majority of the IRS automated notices are being shut down, um, you know, temporarily. It, it, the question is how long. Um, I'm hoping that until they get a good handle on the correspondence backlog, that they will not start the, the notices up again. We've also been talking to the IRS. If you recall about two years ago when they suspended um, uh, pretty much all yeah. correspondence, <laughs> they also suspended issuing statutory notices of deficiency. So when they started back up, there was a lot of notices that went out at the same time. So the court got inundated and then the court ended up with a backlog of inventory. So we're talking with collections and folks in the IRS about when we go back online, so to speak, and those notices begin to get issued, that we spread them out, that they all don't go out on day one, 
that they go out in separate intervals and we spread out the notices and maybe give a little more time than we normally do between notices so that people can get caught up. Um, because the last thing you need is to have, you know, take one of your um, members, have their mailbox be hit with, you know, 400 clients on the same day um, and getting all the correspondence. So hopefully we're going to be able to spread those out when we go back up and start issuing the notices that the IRS will continue to, you know, work with taxpayers and, and work with our office and others to take a reasonable approach on how we get back into the swing of things. So that's good. And and I have to tell you, we were worried about CP91 and CP92 too. Um, what about CP2000? Do you have any insights on that? Yeah, so in my opinion, I, I don't believe they're suspending them. And, and I think that's very similar to the notice and demand that goes out. I want taxpayers to know early on if there's a discrepancy, because if they do owe the tax, I don't want them to wait six months and then get hit with potential interest and penalties. So I do think the CP2000 serve a purpose in the sense of IRS records. And let's take, for example, a 1099. You have a 1099 for $200. You didn't pick it up on your return. It gives the taxpayer an opportunity to say, oops, I, I didn't include it or it's wrong. If it is wrong, unfortunately, you will go into the correspondence pile, but those subsequent notices should stop. So I do think having the CP2000s go out provides taxpayers information that they potentially owe tax. They, they may not agree with the IRS records, right. but if they do, it gives them an opportunity to pay it and stop the interest and potential penalties going forward. Okay, so we do still have concerns with CP2000. We've found that in the past prior to COVID that they have been there have been errors in them. So we do have concerns with that. Do you think um, that the IRS will suspend any other additional notices? You know, again, you say suspend. So again, I think it's how the IRS interprets it. So if they've stopped the process, those notices will also stop. So again, it probably depends which particular notice that you're talking about. Um, we are trying to suspend notices um, that will cause confusion and challenges. So if your members have particular notices that they're interested, please reach out either to myself or to the IRS. <laughs> and you're like, I have a list. Um, <laughs> they can reach out to me too. And I'll make sure you reach out. To, please reach out. Everyone call Melanie. Yeah, that's a better idea. Everyone call Melanie. <laughs> a little bit easier. And then you can reach out to me. Um, because if, you know, we can probably try and provide a little bit of clarification. I mean, even in the blog that we issued yesterday, people were like, really, are you serious about the CP 91 and 92s? Even though I put it in the blog, I think, you know, technically I don't bind the IRS, you know, as in the position that we are as the National Taxpayer Advocate and TAS, although we are part of the IRS and IRS employees, I can't bind the IRS. So um, I think people are always concerned that if I say something, is, is it what the IRS is doing? So I, I can understand the hesitation. But if people see those notices going out, I think when they turned it off, so to speak, some were still on the system. Right. So if there are notices going forward that people are seeing coming out, please reach in because we those should be errors and we should need to get that stopped. Okay, so I have to ask this. Are you satisfied with what the IRS has suspended? Um, do you think they can do more? And I not just am, on the suspension in general. You know, I, I'm happy that they are where they are. Um, you know, could they do more? Every day they could do more. So um, I, as I said, I, I kind of wish that they had done this a number of months ago. Um, but again, what it could have should have don't get us anywhere. It's really how do we fix this going forward? So. Um, you know, I, I am happy that they're suspending it going forward, and I am concerned about how we start back up the process. And as I said, working with the IRS to make sure it's as least painful as possible. Perfect. Okay, so we've heard about the surge teams, mm -hmm. and we've heard that they can handle about six hundred to maybe eight hundred thousand letters or, or parts of the backlog. Now, that's great information to hear. However, when we're talking to a backlog of 23 million returns, yep. it doesn't feel like it's putting a dent into that. How is the IRS ever going to catch up? If they continue doing what they say they're going to be doing, um, some they've some of the, the surge, what we refer to sort of surge one, um, those folks are now online. 
I'm hoping that um, your, your, your members are going to start seeing in the very near future some of those refunds and correspondence being responded to. Um, they, you know, they've got to clear up the back. I mean, it's first in, first out. So when you think about a 1040 return, and that's why we're pushing everyone to file electronically currently, they have to process all of the 2020 paper returns before they're going to start the 2021 paper return. So again, we say this constantly, please have all the taxpayers file electronically, because otherwise I don't think the IRS is even going to get to those May, June, God forbid, July. Um, it, you know, it depends how fast the search team gets working. I would say, I'm looking at the calendar, by the end of March, we'll have a good idea how quickly they're moving um, and how much they're getting through. But as you said, there's, you know, a lot of pieces out there. You've got the 1040s, you've got the business, you've got the 941s, um, you've got correspondence, and we haven't even counted anything like excise tax or, you um, you know, estate tax or other, I'm sure those are out there, but the numbers are not such that we included them, but you throw those on top and, and yeah, it's a big number. It is a big number and it feels a little bit overwhelming and, and it feels, it creates for a membership despair, right? I mean, when you see that and they can't get through on the phones and you know, all the problems. No, it's, it, it has <laughs> been a incredibly hard year uh, for taxpayers. And as again, sitting in your chairs, um, I know what it's like when something doesn't go right, a client calls you and it must be your fault because um, whatever happened, you're the one that prepared the return. So your fault. And so you're kind of getting it in both ends. You're getting it from the client who is obviously not happy um, with the delays and the challenges, but you also have struggles dealing with the IRS, trying to get through, trying to get responses, trying to get answers. So, you know, practitioners, I think almost have a doubly hard because they get it from both sides. Um, and it is very difficult dealing with the client. I, you know, I have the opportunity to speak with a lot of the taxpayers who are struggling with issues. And a lot of the stories are heartbreaking. I mean, they're going through real struggles and the money that, you know, they believe they're entitled to, it, it's, it's very uh, important to them. Some of these folks, it's 20% or more of their, you know, income for the year. So th these are when you have a 10 month delay and that's what a lot of these paper returns are 10 months. I mean, that is just very difficult for them to have to deal with. And you could say be patient, but that's that's not really something they want to hear. That's, or do you want to hear that when I tell you that? Right. So they don't explain it to the taxpayer is difficult because they don't necessarily understand everything that's happening with the IRS. And the IRS has said please be patient with us. But then turning it around and telling someone with a notice looming over their heads, you know, just, just be calm. It'll eventually resolve itself. It doesn't, there's just, right. there's no comfort in that right. for it. So moving on to the, another question for you, um, as you know, we have a position on reasonable cause penalty waiver where we want something similar to the first time abatement, but of course we want to preserve the first time abate. Um, and you have a recommendation for systemic first-time abate. Can you please provide more specifics on your recommendation? Sure. I think as we're all painfully aware is the, what we all refer to as the touch points. How many times a taxpayer practitioner calls the IRS or how many times the IRS has to respond? Those touch points is, are, are causing all sorts of challenges right now. And if we could eliminate those touch points, um, right. that would be huge. So one of our recommendations uh, with respect to the penalties was IRS just make a policy decision, make a business decision across the board, systemically just waive those penalties. We are proposing last year, as well as the current filing season, just, you know, it's painful, but get them out there and, and just do it. You're, you're pointing your finger. Right <laughs> so I'm, I'm asking, are you, are you implying one waiver or are you implying so, to what are you specifically? So as you as you all are very familiar with, first time debate, it's basically your free administrative waiver once every is it every three or four years? I guess you can only do it three <laughs> years. Three. You can't have it the previous three years. So I don't know. Is it every four years? Anyway, so um, the, the challenge is if people have had challenges last year and this year, you would be using it twice, and technically you wouldn't qualify. What we're saying is whatever you want to call it, to call it a COVID waiver, call it a first time abate waiver, it's an administrative waiver. So similar to first time abate, if a taxpayer 
hopefully taxpayers are not delinquent year after year after year. But, you know, if if we just again, it goes to the touch points, just apply it across the board for anything for last year and or this year because of covid and then just move forward. We also are throwing in the additional request um, because, again, putting my old hat on, a lot of our clients have reasonable cause. And by accepting a first time abate waiver, it basically implies you potentially did something wrong. And if you have a challenge down the road, you're trying to argue reasonable cause, they will look and say, but you had a previous penalty. And so I think it's important to give taxpayers the opportunity, if they want to, to come in and request reasonable cause to substitute out for the first time abate if they have sufficient grounds to to establish the reasonable cause defense. And that would be fabulous. Um, it would be fabulous. That would be. Do they always listen to me? Maybe, maybe not. <laughs> But the problem that we're seeing, too, with that is our members do request reasonable cause due to COVID, and it almost seems that they're systemically being denied. Do you have any suggestions as ways to better present the reasonable cause information, you know, to help the assisters or those reviewing these written requests where it doesn't, they don't just automatically reject them out of hand? Yeah, I, I, I don't have, unfortunately, the, the magic or secret formula. I, I think a lot of challenges people are um, experiencing is they're usually calling the practitioner line um, or something else where they're using the reasonable, what is it called, RCA tool, the reasonable cause right. abatement tool, which doesn't have a lot of COVID type factors in it. Um, we are actually working with the IRS right now about revisiting that tool and should there be other things, even things like mental health and other issues that I don't think are clearly explained in the RCA tool. Um, that's not going to help people tomorrow because by the time that gets done, that'll be down the road. Right. But, you know, I do think, unfortunately, it's facts and circumstances. And even though the IRS has provided guidance um, and I think, you know, the, the intention is to be more favorable to waiving the penalties than not, um, there isn't a stated policy that people are following. So it kind of depends on who answers the phone and how they interpret your facts and circumstances, which is not a good answer. Um, and but, you know, I do believe in the system. Uh, painful as it may be, you do have the opportunity to go to the next level uh, all the way up to court if you really wanted to. But, you know, the problem is most people, the penalty is not large enough to to justify the fees. Right. And so you get a lot of clients just saying, it's just not worth it. Let it go. Um, and that's unfortunate that they have to make a business or practical decision to walk away from, in essence, their rights because it costs money. And and we've seen that. We've seen cases where it's just easier to just do the first time abatement versus doing the letter and the waiting and going back and forth with the IRS. Have you seen any trends as to why people are denied reasonable cause? I am not, but since you're asking the question, now I need to go look. Um, I, I haven't Sorry. heard that there's, there's been trends. So um, note to self or any of my guys who are on here, um, let's let's take that away as an action item to see what's going on. As I said, we are um, thinking about the um, RCA tool um, as to is it under the current facts and circumstances, is it taking into account everything? Um, I, I'm just... I might be good at certain things, but getting that done tomorrow is probably not going to happen. <laughs> right. Um, but uh, it is something that we can look into. Okay. Question that has come in, the inability to connect with the IRS is preventing practitioners from gaining information on case closures. Um, what can be done? Yeah, that, that's a challenge. And again, I wish I had the secret answer. Um, you know, I, I am one of the ones early on that was encouraging IRS to take people off the phones to work um, the paper returns uh, and the correspondence. So it's I'm speaking out of both sides of my mouth because at one time, you know, I want them to get the paper done and the other time answer the phone and help people. Um, so I, again, I think it's just we need to get through this next, whether it be three months, six months, nine months, God forbid it go beyond that. Um, we have to get the backlog behind us. The IRS needs to get current before year end. So as I said, I think um, in light of some of the things that they're currently doing, I'm hoping that your members are going to start seeing, you know, help within the month and then continuing thereafter. So I think once they can start making a dent, 
um, I, I think people are going to start saying, oh, this is working. Uh, if we don't see a dent at the end of March, we're going to have issues. Got it. So then my next question to you is, is there I any... I need it when you lift your finger here. It's like I'm in trouble. <laughs> okay, my hands down. <laughs> um, do you have any recommendations for people as to what they can do with the situation? Are there any action items um, that can that that anybody, practitioners, taxpayers can do to help mitigate uh, this process and to help the IRS process the backlog? Yeah, and I think the AICPA does a good job with this, but, you know, and, and I, I you know, introduces the voice of taxpayers. Um, the only way we can be the voice of taxpayers is to have everybody else contribute. So uh, I, I do think that the more voices that are heard, uh, the better, um, you know, so whether or not you come in through AICPA, another organization, or come in on your own, whether it's through TAS or whether it's directly to the IRS or even to a member of Congress, the more voices that are heard on a particular subject or issues, I think the better. Um, it, it's sort of, you know, Joe, you and I have talked about this before. I jokingly call it the pylon theory. You know, when you play football, when everybody jumps on, finally the guy is down and, you know, the play is over. So I, I think of it the same way here is we need to get voices heard. So it's just not the NTA saying this. It's, it is other entities and, and folks that represent taxpayers. Right. So do you know if all or most of the IRS personnel are back at work, you know, after all the COVID closures? Are they fully functioning staffed? So on behalf of TAS and even IRS employees, we have always been at work. We are not in the <laughs> office, but we are at work. Um, and in kudos to my folks. Um, so I arrived on March 30th. Shortly before I arrived, we had shut down offices across the country. So day one, I was working remote. But, you know, our IT and our, our staff and our leadership TAS was operational under a week. We had all of our folks with phones and computers and whatnot. IRS was not as lucky because a lot of their individuals were not able to work remotely prior to the pandemic. A lot of the work has to be physically done in the building, like all of the submission processing, all of the paper returns. So the real challenge has been for the IRS when it first started, getting people back into the building to touch that paper. And then for those who were, were not usually working remotely, getting them computer access, getting them phones, getting them security. And a lot of the folks that were working in campuses, it took a number of months to get them there. And unfortunately, that I call the snowball effect. That's where the problem started and it's continued to grow. And that's why the IRS needs to get the, that backlog done uh, in order to dig out of this hole. So, you know, the IRS had the challenge of being shut down. I think it was about 35 days. Um, they struggled getting current with that 35 days. And then all of a sudden you had COVID where they were shut down for a number of months and then adapting to a remote work. Um, so they, the IRS employees are working. Um, you know, the question is, when are we coming back into the building? And that's above my pay grade, so to speak. I suspect <laughs> it's going to be a lot of the federal agencies are going to be doing things similar. Um, I think we will be taking lead from Department of Treasury and, you know, I, I hope it's soon. Um, I actually like seeing people. I like walking down the hallway and actually having conversations. So uh, I think it, it serves a, a good purpose for many reasons. Uh, but, you know, I do hear a lot of times from folks, when is the IRS going to start working? They have been working. It's just maybe not in the normal situation that people perceive. Although I suspect I could say the same thing for all your members. I suspect you're all working very hard, but probably not in your normal chair. Yes. We're tired. Yes. We're tired and we're ready to move forward. Right. So we don't have a lot of time. Um, I want to touch base on a few more things. Um, if I can, the ERC, our members are, well, the taxpayers aren't getting the refunds. It creates cash yes. flow problems. It just becomes a bigger problem altogether. What are you hearing? What are you seeing? Well, part of the challenge was the 941s were not processed. So they weren't doing any of the amended returns until they got the 941s, in fact, processed. So they are getting closer uh, to getting that done. I think at the end of the year, it was far in excess of $2 million. Um, About a couple of weeks ago, it was a million. I was trying to get the numbers today, and unfortunately, I didn't have them. Uh, but they have been whittling that down. And so then they will process the rest of the amended 941. So um, I know some people are receiving the check, some are not. Similar to everything else, it should be first in, first out. 
Um, but I have heard comments from folks that they've gotten either the third quarter or the fourth, but they didn't see the first quarter. I, I, I don't have a reasonable explanation for that um, other than possibly their situation where that particular person's 941 was in process before uh, that had the, the benefit on it versus the amended return for another quarter. I, you know, not really sure what what's triggering that. We've heard the same thing and we've heard from clients also getting our, our members the third and second in that order and not getting the first. So thank you for um, pointing that out. Okay. Regarding the due dates, we have a mix of opinions. Some people want to bite the bullet, just be done with April 18th deadline. Right. Others, as you know, they're in distress. They need extra time. They want more time. Can you share your thoughts on the upcoming filing due dates and the implications if the IRS were to extend it another filing season? Yeah, I think the challenge from watching from the inside has been painful. Um, I think the IRS and I think the commissioner both prior two years um, stated that he did not believe that the IRS needed the time. Taxpayers may have needed it, but I think he believed that um, IRS did not need the additional time. And you, when you think about what the IRS does in processing, Every time you move a deadline, they've got to go in and redo all of their IT. They've got to change everything because, as you all know, everything's contingent on a filing date. So penalties, interest, I mean, everything um, has to be programmed and changed. And I think that took a lot of the resources away from other things that they were trying to accomplish. Um, you know, we're, we're dealing with one of the issues that we've been pushing both administratively and through a legislative recommendation is anyone who filed on extension the last two years. Fast forward, if they file a refund claim during that same window of the extended period, there's an argument that the look back rule prohibits anyone from receiving a refund if it's after the April 15 deadline. So again, that was an unintended consequence. When you look at the numbers, it's tens of millions of people filed during that window. And even if it's just 10% of people filing refund claims, I mean, that, that's a huge issue that we're putting taxpayers at risk that I don't think anyone intended. So still working on that issue with the IRS, haven't given up. Um, but, you know, things like that come as a result of moving the date. So it, it does cause unintended consequences. Also states, some of the states have been expressed, um, they weren't real happy because if the federal number or date moves, it impacts the state filing. So it, it does have a lot of consequences and, and some of which are unintended. Right. We also have a slide, Erin, where we have a couple of links um, for the resources that you provide. As you can see, it touches base on obviously the taxpayer advocate slide, but also to the, your report to Congress, which we referenced, the blog, which we also referenced, and also the roadmap so that people can take a look. At the roadmap yeah, if you're not, I mean, not everyone deals with procedural issues all the time. Right. Um, and, you know, a client may, you know, occasionally have a challenge in collections or something else. So the roadmap is actually a really good tool to kind of give you um, a big picture of from beginning to end of a tax return. And it does hyperlink various notices and, and provide other information. So sometimes, you know, if you're not familiar before that client comes in, it's a really good cheat sheet um, to kind of get you familiar with the process. Um, and it, it's a good reference. So Aaron, thank you. Um, we've gone over time. I wish I could keep you for forever and keep you online asking you more questions. You're always great to talk to. And I really can't thank you enough for your time. And we do appreciate all the work that you're doing. So thank well, you. Thanks, Aaron. Melanie. It's good to see you again. And uh, thanks for having me. Thank you. Hey there, we're waiting for Ed Carl to join so that we can get into our technical update section. But I'm sure, um, like me, you guys learned a lot from that conversation with Aaron Collins and Melanie. So Melanie, thank you again for making that connection for us and for getting um, a very busy Aaron onto the, onto the town hall for us. Lots of thank yous for the work that Aaron's been doing throughout the pandemic to help you help your clients. So, so we appreciate that. Um, hey, Lisa, so we, we're going to be bringing that up in a second. Why don't we go to your technical updates first, and then we'll do the K2, K3. Oh, I keep them all waiting for the K2, that, K3 right. update that they're anxiously waiting for. There's a few questions out there in K2, K3. Oh, There's Ed. Ed just... Hey, Ed. <laughs> 
Yeah, I don't I don't know what happened with my camera. Things uh, froze for a second. And I, I know K2, K3 is something that uh, our members are uh, really top of mind. Um, and frankly, with all the discussions that Melanie and Aaron just had about the backlog and the problems, it, it, it really connects, unfortunately. So, you know, the last time we had a town hall, Mark Peterson spoke about K2, K3. The IRS had just, just provided transitional relief information. They had modified the FAQs. They provided that one FAQ 15, which provided some transitional relief, but um, changed and edited uh, various other FAQs. Um, and so th that was the question. Well, doesn't that fix our problem? Isn't that enough? And unfortunately, um, after we took a really heavy dive into those changes, we don't think it's enough. We, we think it's confusing. It'll lead to inconsistent application. When you add on that there's no e-file yet, um, the software providers haven't caught up. Uh, a lot of uh, practitioners haven't worked with their clients on processes to gain the information that they need to get. And frankly, the purpose of of the K2K3 was to gain some kind of consistency of approach and lessen confusion. And, and let me be clear, AICPA supports IRS in their approach to gain this consistency, to use uh, uh, something like a K2K3 to provide the information that is important and necessary. But as I said a second ago, when you add all of this on to the backlog and the problems and you can't reach IRS and we're trying to lessen the need to contact the IRS, lessen the touches so that they can possibly dig out of the huge hole that they're in, we're pushing. We've been pushing, frankly, the morning of the last town hall. Jan Lewis, the chair of our executive committee, testified at a Senate Finance Committee hearing where she said the, the K2, K3 relief is not enough. We need to push this off another year. We said the same thing the next day in a long technical letter to IRS. And then a few days later, we um, partnered with 52 of the state CPA societies to submit a letter to IRS and Treasury saying the same thing. You've got to push this off another year. It's really, we appreciate relief. It's not enough and it's, it's not going to work well. Um, frankly, we've reached out to the Office of Management and Budget because one of the issues that we've identified is the Paperwork Reduction Act which OMB administers, and it deals with the burden that federal agencies place on, on the public and on taxpayers in this particular case. And we think there is a, a, a big problem by adding to the instructions in January, changed the um, parameters of, of uh, what information is being collected from the public. And, and, and they didn't change the uh, OMB review. So we think there is a big problem there. And, and lastly, we have a meeting scheduled with Treasury next week to talk about the backlog, but also to talk about um, K2, K3. So, you know, I, I mentioned that um, the, the relief, the transitional relief came out February 16th. Um, it may, may help some of you. But we don't know for sure. It's it's confusing. There, um, there's language in in the FAQs that is uh, a little bit difficult to understand whether you meet it or not. Um, language dealing with indirect partners or shareholders. Language dealing with um, knowing whether or not they may have um, foreign tax credits. Um, so th those are some of the problems, and that's why. Um, that's why we continue to push. And the two key asks that we're making of IRS and Treasury, we're asking them to completely postpone the, um, the utilization of K2, K3 until next year, another year, um, the 2023 uh, tax season. 
And we're also asking them to suspend assessment of penalties for this year completely. Now, you may be familiar with um, the notice 2021-39 that was released last fall. And, and that notice provided some kind of um, a penalty relief, but it means that the filer has to establish with for the satisfaction of the IRS that it made a good faith effort to comply. Well, what does that mean? How do you establish that? Well, they did give information about changes to systems or processes or procedures would be uh, evidence of good faith attempt. But why do you want to have a system that's 25 million returns, pieces of mail, adjustments in the whole, just like the National Taxpayer Advocate spoke about? Why do you want to have a system where the IRS may issue these penalties and then the taxpayer and their practitioner are going to have to show how they made a good faith attempt? And I'm worried about the circular nature of of the notices. You're certainly not going to be able to get through in, on the phone. So how do you show? How are you going to show evidence that you made a good faith attempt? We're saying just suspend assessment completely of these penalties for this year. So again, we're we're talking about this year. E even if they postpone till next year, something's going to come online. Uh, if you can go to the next slide, it is important for all of our members to become familiar with this. Maybe not right now when you're so swamped. We appreciate you coming on to the town hall because we know how busy you are. Um, but our tax section has put together a lot of resources for you. And one in particular, it, you'll see it in the middle of the slide. It says new transitional challenges. When you go on the link to that page, there are a couple of entry points into a new blog, a new pod, I'm sorry, a podcast. And that podcast is terrific. It, it, it is about 30 minutes. Again, I just mentioned, I know how busy you are, but it, it really is worth taking those 30 minutes when you possibly can to listen to that podcast. I think it'll help you out quite a bit. And, and I wanna support you on that podcast. I've listened to it twice already. And I probably need to listen to it a couple more times, but it is a really good um, conversation between April Walker and one of our, our practitioners who's been working on one of the committees dealing with K2, K3. And, it, and it's going to give you some good insights into the, the practicalities of and some of the questions around um, what's still open on K2, K3. I know so many are still confused about who does it apply to? And, you know, then what next if the tax software still hasn't been updated to um, produce the, the forms? Should it, is it better to go ahead and um, extend the return? Then you've got the ripple effect of the impact on that on your individual clients. Or do you file it as a PDF and submit it that way? So lots of questions on the, on the minds of our, our practitioners out there. But yeah. some good resources to help explain it to your clients. Absolutely. Thank you, Ed. I appreciate that. So I wanted to bring you an update on um, some great news about resources that have just been released for audits of federal pandemic funding. So uh, a couple of weeks ago, Mary Folster was on to talk about some of the, the open items that we had in this audit space. So let's kind of start with a, a little bit of a re refresher. The Provider Relief Program went to governmental entities, not-for-profits, and for-profit healthcare entities. So this was established by the CARES Act way back when, in March of 2020. It's a very complex program, and it's unusual in many ways, but also because these for-profit entities we're getting funding that's now subject to health and human services audit requirements. So the Governmental Audit Quality Center has been working for a year on this practice aid that we've listed there for you. They've been working with HHS along the way, and it's been you know, a good collaborative exercise, but it's taken a while because HHS has been um, having some delays in issuing their guidance. They've changed the rules a few times. 
but we've come to the point where we've got some great FAQs, illustrative schedules, notes, auditors reports, so good information for you there. Um, and this is for for-profit entities. So if you're auditing a for-profit entity getting this that got this money, it's going to be helpful. But also if you're the entity that got this, you might want to take a look at it as well. As a reminder, um, uh, we expect that for-profit entities who expended more than 750000 in PRF in, in their um, calendar year, 1231, will be subject to audit. So we've given you a link to a webcast that um, if you're in this space, if you think you've got a client who's now going to be subject to this type of audit, make sure you're watching that webcast. Um, and, and I've got some additional resources we'll be pointing to you to. But we've also got another practice aid, and this one's called Audit Scope Practice Aid. So this one is for all types of entities that got PRF monies, because what GAQC has found is that a lot of these entities are really complex in their organizational structure. So they might have some parent sub relationships that make the, the audit a little um, tricky to, to navigate. So this practice aid has a decision tree that's gonna help the entity or the auditor look at the implications on the scope of the audit for these types of entities. And um, it's applicable if you've got both general and targeted distributions of this pan, um, provider relief funds. So a lot going on there, but I do wanna give a, a shout out to our, our Governmental Audit Quality Center. The volunteers have been working really hard for over a year on these resources and working very diligently with um, HHS to get some resources to you. They have made these available to the public. So it, all you have to do is set up a registered user account and these are not restricted to AICPA membership or the Governmental Audit Quality Center. Then on the next slide, I'll hit a couple of other topics. The first one is on the Shuttered Venue Operator Grant. So um, again, our advocacy governmental team has been working with the SBA, the OMB on SVOG. And basically we've been pushing for more detail on what the SBA expects around for-profit audits for the SVOG funds um, that can either be a single audit or a program specific audit, but we want a, more details. So we're still waiting on the exact timeline, but working hard on it, pushing them. And we're hoping that um, we'll have that soon. So stay tuned. The Governmental Audit Quality Center does expect to have to issue some wraparound guidance on that. So again, stay tuned to that. The next issue is around coronavirus state and local fiscal recovery fund. Say that three times fast. So this is for a lot, thousands of local um, entities got this money. And so we've been working with OMB and Treasury on finding an audit approach for a lot of the smaller entities. So we've identified 20,000 or so small cities, towns, Governmental, other governmental units and their auditors were trying to find a less um, burdensome approach to auditing these funds. So again, stay tuned. We're hoping to get a finalization of that approach and a federal register notice surrounding this alternative in the near term. And we do also expect that we might have to issue some additional um, guidance to ensure that everyone understands what the, the approach to the engagement should be. We've also released some tips for both the auditors and the organizations that are new to single audit. You know, we've talked in the past on town hall about this isn't a space you just jump into. So we wanna make sure that you, you know what, um, what is expected if you're doing this type of work. So you've got some single audit tips for the auditors and for those organizations that are going to be subject to this. This is all outlined in a uh, GAQC website that I've given you a link to, and um, you'll see an alert in there that goes into some of the details on this. And I think Carl and Eric are going to join us to um, have a conversation with Carl about some tax season um, tips and strategies that he's developed in, based on his conversations and his experience. 
Well, thanks, Lisa. Uh, great update uh, by by you and Ed. So, so welcome, Carl. Let's uh, let's bring Carl up. So, Carl, it's it's great to have you here uh, in New York. Uh, and as you all know, Carl leads the small firm section uh, area at the AICPA. He's talking to small firms all the time. So, uh, Carl, a lot of information from Aaron Collins and from Ed. Uh, there. Um, so why don't you unpack it a little bit and, and, and tell the tell the audience what you've been discussing with with firms? Yeah. You know, we're, we're so late in the season. We you know, you think about processes and workflow. Everybody's already got their processes and workflow in place. So it's tough to implement anything really new. But I think this is a, a, a time of year, too, when you look at your processes. I think there's a lot of firms that don't have a workflow application or software product. And, and looking forward to next year to be prepared for the next tax season. It's, it's time to really consider getting a workflow application right after tax season. Um, but, you know, but everybody has their own process, right? So one of the things that we did and what I know firms are doing right now, you're meeting some, well, the workflow application, you might be meeting every day, having a dashboard on where are we at as a firm? You know, how many tax returns do we expect to do this year? What's the data in, data out? That's what we did every week we had a meeting and it was an exciting day every Tuesday to generate the reports to say, okay, you know, we're going to do X number of returns. And we actually break it out by partnership, S Corp, exempt organization, individual. How many return data files do we have in, in-house yet? How many have gone out? Where are they at in process? And with the workflow application, you could break that down even further. So it's important to have. But I know when I talk to firms right now, they're telling me that they are behind uh, when they're doing the same analysis that they were doing. I've had firms share with me where they're at and up to today, you know, they're fine and they're getting behind and they're finding that getting further and further behind. And so it's now, to, you know, time to start thinking about extensions. Uh, we look at the pain points that uh, firms have data input, right? Um, <clears throat> you know, what's the best way to get the input in where we might be short on staffing. Uh, we're definitely not short on the work that has to get done. Pay point. One of the big pains was data entry. And one of the things that we did, and I know a lot of all the software companies have, you know, a scan and populate, um, you know, component of their software. It doesn't always work great. Uh, if your experience with it before wasn't so positive, uh, it might be time to try that again. Because I think to get these extensions done, you're going to have to go in and make sure that data is in there in some fashion. And of course, you can still outsource if, if you, you know, uh, are needing people and bodies and get things done. There's always the outsourcing. Uh, opportunities of many, many companies that uh, will help you get that done and get that started. Um, I think maybe the, the thing to do, maybe after listening to uh, Ed talk about K2, K3s, you know, when I was sitting and listening, I was thinking, you know, I would extend every single return I have right now on on tap for my pass-through entities. Uh, you know, it, our partnerships, you know, our firm was so heavy into partnerships and S-corporations, uh, getting them out right now with K2K, because almost all of our clients, and I think a lot of our clients, a lot of your clients, especially the ones you normally would get out year in and year out, um, have foreign activity. And when you have the unknown whether or not you're going to have to file a K2K3, it's probably best to extend. And it's relatively easy, as you all know, to extend your pass-through ent entities um, by March 15th. And we only have 12 days left to do it. Um, so I would definitely do that rather than filing it and going back and amending and have to adding, you know, a K2, K3. But I think the real challenge is when you're thinking about extending your individuals. And now's the time you really need to start thinking about extending those individuals. Um, you know, I, I think a lot of people like we did had built into your engagement letter. You have a date, right? A drop dead date. If you don't get your data in by March 15th or whatever that date was, we started at April 1st. Then we after several years of experience, we went to March 21st, and then we backed it off to March 15th. And uh, if you don't get that data in, you need to start extending, and you need to hold true to that. One of the things I've talked to with uh, various practitioners is that we so often we get into that uh, letting the client really dictate our anxiety level, right? Dictate what we have to get done, what needs to get done. And now's the time, really, especially after two years of disruption, you need to take control and manage client expectations. And that includes your individual extensions. Um, you know, in fact, as I talk about individual extensions, we might want to go to the next um, slide because it's very important. These are some of the reasons that we did what we did in our practice, right? Clients not responding. We're not getting any data. Uh, you know, it's, it, the, the, the information is terrible. 
you've got to clean it up. Well, you're at a point now in tax season where you can't, you don't have time to clean it up. And so, uh, you know, when you think about getting these extensions done, what are your choices? You know, you, you look, I'm sure we all do the same thing. You, you try to find the right safe harbor for filing an extension. Uh, you try to get data from the client. You're killing yourself to get it done. I think what you need to do is set the client expectations and make sure that they understand that, you know what, March 15th is here and it's come and gone, maybe. We're going to file an extension. Give me the data. If you don't get the data, what you need to do is, is maybe you have to decide, I'm not going to do the return. I'm not going to do the extension. One of the things that we did when we had clients that didn't provide us the information or we didn't get feedback from them, when it came to file that extension, we always communicated to make sure that they knew we were going to file that an extension needed to be filed. And we would actually, I know some firms actually say, you know what, we're not, no data, no extension. But what we do, we, we would actually print out a blank, you know, extension forms and say, you go ahead and file. So you figure it out and you file it. And that was the end of that. Uh, at the same time, we had clients where they didn't know where they were. They still communicated with us just for whatever reason, they couldn't get the data in. And we trusted those clients, like you probably trust most of your clients. We'd say, you know what, how much money do you have available? You give me a number, is it 10,000, 20,000, 100,000? We'll allocate between federal and state and get that paid in. But I think the big key takeaway is to make sure that, and, I, and you know, I've said this, I think every time I've been on here, managing client expectations. And the other thing is, you know, if you think about it, if you back off from April 15th, if you're going to extend a particular client, well, first of all, you already know who your clients you extended each and every year. They should be extended already. Those clients do not typically change from one year to the next. So you already know who you're gonna to have to extend. So why not do it now? But then those that you don't know about necessarily, they're gonna probably need that week ahead of the 18th of April to figure out where they're gonna get the money from and have that money available. So for you to get to that point, you probably need to get either, if you have all enough data to calculate where they really truly should be on that tax return, but you don't have time to review it, you need to get in a week earlier so you can get that in, you know, that review process done to a point where that you can uh, give an idea what that extension number is going to be and the taxes that are due. So when you back all those things up, especially once April 1st comes, that's definitely a drop dead date that any, if, if the return's not, no data is in and actually any data that's in maybe and not finished and reviewed that tax return should get filed. So. It's all part communication and everything else, Eric. Well, Carl, that was a, a great summary. One question that that came in, many questions that came in, but just how do you manage billing if you if you extend, you know, more than half? How, how are you going to get get paid? Um, yeah, you know, I, I get that question quite a bit. Just because you extend it, all you're doing is giving yourself time. You need to give that client another due date, right? If you're going to go extend them and they've got the data in, or they don't have the data in. You need to give them that due date. Just because it got extended to 9-15 or 10-15 doesn't mean you can't, you need to dictate when that due date really is. Am I going to get the return done by June 1st? That's my new due date. That's the due date you give to that client. Or maybe it's May, right? There's no reason you need to necessarily extend when they're going to pay you or when you're going to bill them. Get that work done. Don't let the client dictate your timing. Take control. Well, uh, Carl, thank you very much. It's great uh, having you here in New York. We're, we're, we've covered so much today. We're going to just use the open forum uh, portion here to to thank uh, today's presenters, Ed, uh, Carl, Melanie Lauridson, Carl Peterson, uh, Lisa Simpson, and, and Aaron Collins. A lot of positive comments on all of these updates today. So here's, here's our, in, in summary, you know, we do recommend you leveraging these slides, share them with your clients, share them with other members uh, of your firm. And we also have all the recent uh, town hall series available via archive on YouTube or the AICPA TV station. Uh, so take advantage of that. Uh, we continue to, uh, you know, look out and see uh, what discussion is occurring related to the town hall on social media. Uh, we, we appreciate the discussion. We appreciate you, you highlighting things. Here's some tweets uh, from the past week. So join this discussion. We try to stay active. Uh, once again, if you're not subscribed to our newsletter, for some reason, maybe you opted out to some newsletters by going to this URL, uh, you can opt in. And we send that newsletter out 
uh, the following week around Tuesday, and we try to summarize some of the uh, the top questions that were asked and and highlight uh, resources that that you can leverage uh, based on uh, the previous week's town hall. Here's an upcoming webcast that you may want to attend. Um, a lot of stress is going on right now. Here's a, a webcast about you know supporting you know boundaries and your overall well-being. The next uh, town hall will be March 17th. Today we had over 9,000 attendees, so we greatly value uh, this hour with you. We learn a lot from the questions. We appreciate your engage engagement, and we look forward uh, to our next town hall with you on March 17th. That's all for now. Thank you very much. Thank you for your participation. You can now subscribe to the AICPA Town Hall series on your favorite podcast platform, as well as watch archives on YouTube and AICPA TV. Tune in for live broadcasts Thursdays at 3 p.m. Eastern Time.